things about the state of our nation, food insecurity, cost of living rising, housing stresses. We've heard about the horror of war in the Ukraine, about food insecurity, read famine in Somalia. And this morning I'm thinking in particular about information that's emerging from COP27. The Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, says, we're in the fight of our lives and we're losing. We're on a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. Pacific nations are even now planning for the possibility of relocation, of the evacuation of climate refugees and all that that might mean. If we destroy our planet, what will anything matter? We're coming to the end of the ordinary Sundays in the liturgical calendar, the teaching and exploring Sundays. We're closing in on the dark times and preparing for Advent, the stock take season, with its invitation to change and to wait. And of course, followed by Christmas and the coming of the light and the possibility of new life. So it's an intense few weeks in our Christian calendar. It's a difficult time because if we are to take it seriously, it demands a response. And you might well wonder if it's all too hard, too bleak. Waking up to the signs of the times as we're invited to do and coming to terms with matters that need our committed attention if we are to make changes is tough. And we rightly wonder, we should wonder, if it's all too hard for us, if it's worth it, if we can manage it, if this is what being a Christian is all about. I'm saying this today because I'm taking the gospel writer we call Luke as my model. In today's gospel, you, Luke uses images and language that are shocking. You heard that reading. Luke has Jesus redirect the gaze of his listeners from the beauty of it, the temple and all its adornment to its destruction. Not one stone will be left upon another. When will this be? The people ask Jesus to be told soon. And there will be wars and insurrection, and nation will rise against nation, kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be earthquakes and famine and plagues in various places. The end of the world is in sight in this passage. Could he be speaking to us? It all sounds familiar, like a reading from the New Zealand Herald. There is no more waiting time. Horror and destruction are upon the people. But remember, Luke was writing after all these things had already happened. After that time in, from 66 to 70, when there was great persecution of the Christian people, and the temple was destroyed by the Roman occupation. For Luke, the impact of Jesus uttering these seeming end time predictions in his gospel is, amongst other things, to show the people what a great and reliable prophet Jesus is. For Luke's hearers have already experienced these things, including the persecution, the betrayal, and the alienation from family. Luke is warning his hearers, do not be seduced by surface beauty, or led astray by false promises, or people claiming easy solutions. 
Matters are in dire straits, but hang in, don't give up the struggle, persist in your vision for a better world. Across more than 2,000 years, there is still relevance in this text. This little apocalypse sounds shocking. It should shock us out of any complacency to turn a blind eye to the state of things in our nation, in our world, or with planet Earth. You know, as I know, we have to be very careful about reading our contemporary situation back into the historical text and interpreting what we find in those writings through the lens of our contemporary scientific and technological world. Jesus' day was not scientific as we understand that term today. There were commonly held expectations about the end of the world and what you could expect when it happened that we find quite strange and unbelievable, but they were there depending upon your lifestyle and the choices that you made. The Bible doesn't address the issue of the climate crisis, so we cannot go to the Bible looking for a solution. However, it does point us in the direction of moral or ethical behavior that will have an impact on our capacity to face the behaviors and, the sh and shape our attitude and relationship with the earth, including the peoples that inhabit it along with us. It does challenge us to choose the future that we want to work for and to decide and act for at every possible opportunity. And we will find in the Bible the clues to, restorative just, to the restorative justice impetus necessary for both the mitigation and the adaptation necessary if there is to be a future for our grandchildren and all living beings. We need to restore our right relationship with the earth just as we need to restore right relations with people we might have wronged either by direct action or lack of insight and action. In Advent, we will declare we long for a future where justice and righteousness are the hallmarks of our human activity. For this to be so, some things need to change and change urgently. Change is not easy. It has a cost. Think Nelson, Nelson Mandela and all his years in prison. Sometimes the cost is grief, and sometimes it's anger, and sometimes it's conflict. But we can't have change that will restore the health of the planet while continuing to enjoy the comforts of life as we have shaped it. Nor can we expect change without alienating some people. Not everyone will be happy if we increase taxes on petrol-driven cars or restrict private motor vehicles from entering the CBD, or disestablish dairy farms in Canterbury, for example. Christian faith does not remove us from conflict, but it can help us choose when and how conflictual situations might open the way for the activities of God when it might be the time to make mountains level and to raise up low valleys and to make the roads straight, as a popular Advent reading says. Sometimes it's important to be angry. Anger itself is simply a surge of energy and can be directed destructively or used positively. Sometimes it's important to confront directly the issues that face us and find the energy to face change. If we are really interested in the kingdom of God that we pray for, 
that alternative to the imperial powers of the princes of fossil fuel and their petrol economy, then now is the time for us to get angry. Now is the time for us to prepare for conflict. Now is the time for us to ramp up our gentle persuasion into something more strident. Now is the time for shocking speech and stirring action if we care about the life of the planet and the future of our children and our grandchildren and the other creatures of the earth. Now is the time to face the fact they may not have a future if we continue on our current trajectory using fossil fuels, methane gas, chemical fertilizers, and destroying food producing land. The future is closing in on us. Our demand for more and more money and more possessions and bigger and better everything and GDP growth year by year is bringing the end times closer. We're killing not just the future for life on planet Earth, but the lives of countless people now. We are in a pathological spiral to extinction. Theologian and ethicist Carol Robb notes, the industrialized nation's economic patterns of production and consumption since 1800 are the source of most greenhouse gas emissions. We know our policymakers continue to favor policies that have as results these harms, and they do it knowingly and willingly. The leaders of the nations know how to decrease the harm, but few are doing it. They are behaving unethically. So let us stop talking about climate change. Climate crisis, as Greta Thunberg would say, is not even strong enough. The weather is on steroids, wildfires, hurricanes, heat waves, floods. And let us stop talking about Mother Earth, with all the connotations attached of gentle, caring, unconditional love that will feed us and clothe us and clean up after us no matter what we do. Instead, perhaps we dare to talk about planet Earth as our life partner and include in our understanding the shared responsibilities of mutual care that being a life partner holds. For we do not have unlimited time in which to wait for a solution to the problem of life that we have created to emerge. Nor can we simply buy our way out of destruction, no matter how much money we have. And we can't simply summon up a technological solution that will deal swiftly with all the interlocking aspects of the climate crisis, no matter how brilliant the minds addressing the situation are. We all need to work together. Currently, we're faced with an immediate three-pronged approach. Mitigation reducing our dependency on fossil fuels and food production that we know exacerbate the problem. Adaptation, changing how and where we live. And a social revolution, changing what we think are the important things about life, imagining a different future and persisting in our vision. Now is the time to confront our economic patterns and our political relationships and admit they are not life-enhancing. For the followers of Jesus at the end of the first century to whom Luke was writing, the end had come. 
The temple had been destroyed, stones had tumbled, fires had burned it all up, and family was at war with family. They were nevertheless being invited to remain faithful to Jesus' vision of the kingdom of God come on earth and to persist in their efforts to bring that to reality. We are invited to choose the vision of the future that we will work for. If we fail to choose a different way from the one that has brought us to this precipice, the beauty of planet Earth will be only a memory, as the beauty of the temple was a memory for Luke's audience. Apocalyptic writing sought to set out the suffering and problems of the times, to remind the people of a different, that a different future was possible for those who worked for it, and to declare that God remained faithful and with the faithful, working with them through their grief and anger and fear toward a life-giving future in which all living beings could flourish. That faith is our inheritance. The prophets of old used shocking images. Jesus used shocking actions. Luke uses shocking language. Are we brave enough to shock our contemporaries into action? You know what time it is. How it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. What are we? What are we after the when the earth flexes her muscles? No gentle embrace from this mother now. What are we when the waters tower and roll? No peaceful rocking from this mother here. What are we when the wild winds roar? No breath of life from this mother's spirit. What are we when elemental fires rage? No healing warmth in this mother's arms. How small we are in our puffed up suits, our inflated egos, our strength of mind, carrying our piled high purse. Another aftershock, fires in control, death in the water of life. We have no control. The rules we bend, the money we make, the minds we admire cannot help us. This earth and her power is not for us. We are parasites on the thin skin of this whirling planet. Our earth does not know us, does not mind us. Our universe does not care that we are small and afraid. O oh God, energy, by whatever name, overflow your compassion so we are washed in hope with eyes open to the size of things. <laughs>